Good evening. This is the April meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. As is becoming our custom more and more often, we're going to start the uh, evening with an item which is not on the agenda, and I would like to uh, invite one of our sixth grade teachers, uh, Janet Nesson, to uh, come forward and tell us what we're going to see now. Janet? It's not <laughs> Incidentally, before you start, I think you are going to show us a tape, aren't you? Yes. Then I would invite the school board and everybody else up here to Sit down. Great. go down into the audience so we can see it also. <coughs> While they're moving down, this I'm going to do nothing but introduce the stu two students who came here, and they'll let you know what we're showing you. I have a student from my class and a student from Mr. Paul Casey's class, um, Misty Pendexter and Colleen Minden. We're students, in, we're sixth grade students um, that work with Mr. Gorham. He comes in every day to help teach our science class, and he was nominated for the Jefferson Award by the Bremer family and the Newcomb family for his volunteer work. Um, we would like to show you the commercial that Channel 6 made about him. Mr. Gorham is a great person and a fun teacher. Even though he volunteers, he still puts in quality time into teaching. He tries to help you perfect things and make them right. He always has something fun planned. If you have a question, he is always there to answer it or help you find it. When he goes on a trip, he is always missed, and even though he keeps in touch. Mr. Gorham also puts in a lot of time to conserve the earth. You can always depend on Mr. Gorham. Thank you for coming uh, this evening and showing us that tape, uh, and thanks especially to Mr. Gorham. He sets a fine example for, for all of us, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him uh, in our school. Now we'll begin the formal part of our meeting. Uh, the first item uh, is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any uh, adjustments from the board or superintendent from the public? Seeing none, we'll go forward to the first item, which is the approval of the school board minutes, uh, the meeting held on March 12th. Charlie, oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> no 
No comments? Then I would entertain a motion that the uh, minutes be approved as drafted. I move that we accept the minutes as drafted for the March school board meeting. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. The business manager's report, D. Thank you, Peter. Uh, this report, the end of March, marks the third, uh, end of the third quarter financial reports. Uh, as far as the revenue, revenues and expenditures in the general program, they have been received and expended as projected. The federal programs also are pretty much on target. Big indicator again this month again occurs in the uh, food service program where as far as cash for the month we have we did re realize the eight thousand dollar profit for the year the school lunch program as far as cash is still under by roughly uh, nine thousand dollars however when you look at the report and look at the uh, fund balance last year at this time we had a a negative 22,228 fund balance compared to this year for the same period of a positive $2,397. So there is a quite a substantial variance of $24,626 year-to-date program. Uh, again, I hope that this continues and we do end up uh, June with possibly some of the or most of the decrease that we had realized last year in the $36,000 along with the $25,000 that is in the, the uh, budget to uh, defray the cost. Uh, community services to date still has a, a healthy balance. Most of the revenues, however, for the year are in. Uh, they have received to date, $432,000 out, out of a projected $431,000, so they're over projected revenues. Their expenditures as of the end of March are $323,000 with a, a uh, budget of $431,000. We will update uh, the end of April. We should have or try to target uh, year-end balances for you people in, in a lot of these funds. We're keeping a close eye on we're, we're encumbering all that we can as far as the uh, general program, as far as uh, purchases. Uh, the system seems to be working quite well. And hopefully by uh, the April, the, uh, sorry, the May meeting, we'll have uh, year-end balances for you people. Enrollments for the district on page uh, 69 are 1,575 for the month compared to 1,573 last month. So there again, our enrollments, and these are the enrollments that will be used to, to, uh, to figure our subsidy for next year. We use uh, October 1st enrollments and April 1st enrollments, and you take the average of those two, 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 two uh, six-month periods. The rest of the reports are uh, informational reports as far as the fuel oil, the electricity in the, in the uh, buildings, and the transportation accounts as far as gasoline and, and diesel and unleaded gas. If you have any questions on these, I'd rather try to answer. Charlie? On page 66, revenues and expenditures, yeah. there are two accounts that have, there were 89, 90 balances, diverse intelligence and diverse in intelligence yeah. slash support materials. They were, we've received the revenues, but we don't seem to have spent very much of those. The, uh, <coughs> the PO is that the purchase orders are going out uh, possibly this week teacher in charge of those accounts has been to my office last week and there are some purchases to be made to expend the balance of those monies. Uh, the other one is the Coalition of Essential Schools has a expenditure but no income. Yeah, that is, uh, I think Mr. Miles may be able to help me on this one. That is, uh, we report I think back last fall that the, uh, that the high school got a, a grant or, and we did have one expenditure for a couple staff members to go to a conference. I believe the way this is going to be handled, maybe I stand to be correct, is that we need to send the paid expenditures or paid invoices to the coalition to get reimbursed. Okay. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to say, Frank? <laughs> 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 And I have one other question. On the Cape Elizabeth School electricity log, yep. 
Why are the middle school and high school electricity, why is it one account? It's not split into two? It, it goes back years. We have one meter for the middle school and the high school. And there's a, quite a distance between the two schools. True, but it's the, 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 uh, the, the wiring is there. What we're doing now, we're looking to do is, uh, I signed a, uh, a request. Our engineer went out and talked to CMP as to uh, what it would cost to update our meter to, to, to handle the demand. It was like 800 and some dollars. That should be done within the next couple of weeks. Also, there is a, another device out there we can purchase where we could, uh, we could, we wouldn't separate the meters, but we could tell which school is, is using what. So we might look into that and have that installed. I think that was my question. Yeah. So Ian, how are you going to be able to monitor individual schools if you have one meter for two schools? We're doing uh, a percentage basis type thing, based on square footage for the time being. Yeah. The other accounts, as far as the uh, fuel on that, uh, it's, it's been a great winter as far as temperature and a, and a great fall, uh, spring, I'm sorry. So we've leveled off. and. The decreases we thought we might anticipate in some of these accounts might not occur. But again, we'll see what happens next month or so. It all depends on whether or not you believe in global warming. You got it. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Dean. Thank you. The middle school representatives, Rachel, Good evening. Um, Shauna Stevens will be presenting with me tonight. Um, the sign chorus had a successful trip to Cape Cod over the weekend. They saw the Acton Science Museum and taught seven classes in a chorus. They visited Cragville Beach, Woods Hole, Oceanographic Institute and Aquarium. And they sang at two church services and a class after exploring Plymouth Plantation an Indian village, as well as Thor Thornton Burgess's home, and then return home. The middle school talent show was held Friday, April 5th. Eight members of the middle school band who auditioned for, the, for a Triple C concert to be held May 11th were all accepted. And seventh and eighth grade middle school swim teams are the state champions, and there was a meet held at Bowdoin last, the last week in March, which determined that. Spring sports are now underway. The middle school yearbook is in the final stages and will go into print Friday. Sixth graders leave for Chewankee on Monday, April 22nd. This year, the students raised almost 100% of the funds needed to pay for Chewankee by fundraising projects. They were required to pay the lowest per student cost yet. The middle school dance is April 26th. Report cards will go home Friday and ranks close last Thursday. And students at the middle school would like to send get well wishes to our eighth grade teacher, Mr. Moore, and would like to like him to know that we miss him and wish him a speedy recovery. Thank you very much. The high school. Good evening. Uh, once again, the high school is going to be participating in Earth Week. We have a whole week of, of activities planned that's going to take place the 22nd through the 26th of April. That's the week after vacation. Such activities include an environmental career fair put on by the guidance department, a cleanup at Fort Williams in the school campus by the students, um, an ecology room. I'm not quite sure what this is. It's some kind of surprise that the ecology club is putting together. Um, different speakers from environmental programs around the state are coming to talk to students. And an earth dance is going to be held Friday night to sort of wrap up the week. Also, shirts are going to be sold um, during the week for students. And the proceeds will go to benefit environmental programs. Um, the stage band, jazz combo, and the chorus present a jazz performance Wednesday, April 10th at 7.30 in the high school cafe. Um, the public is welcome. And they, they, per, they sort of presented a tapered performance of that today, last period, so students got a chance to see what that's going to be like. Um, the cast and crew of Ernie's Incredible Hallucinations, uh, our regional entry to the State Drama Festival, 
traveled to Limestone, Maine this past weekend to participate in the State Drama Festival. We didn't actually place in that, but um, we've all heard that the play was a, a success. Um, and the senior trip to Chiwanki, which was held last week, that's April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, had about 27 people go, and that was a success. The weather held out, so we didn't actually get too cold. And the only complaint was that the trip wasn't long enough, and we see why the sixth graders go for a whole week. Personally, it was the best time I've had for a really long time, and I hope that the sixth graders have as good a time as I did. On March 27th, um, <coughs> excuse me, on March 27th, Fine Arts and Technology Night was held at the high school. This was the first year that Technology Night had been included, and it combined to make a really enjoyable evening. Also this year, for um, once again, there are four members of the high school speech team that will be participating in the speech nationals, and they'll be held in Chicago this year. They include Peter Glasser for the second year in a row in domestic extemp, Peter Freilinger in foreign extemp, John Woodward in humorous interpretation, and Dan Berman for the second year in a row in humorous interpretation. Also, this week, SAC is holding their elections. This year, SAC amended their constitution to have our elections earlier in, in April so that we can have a chance to incorporate our SAC meetings into the schedule because as, as it is now, SAC meetings are held generally every other, thir every other week on a Thursday and it goes on a period on a rotating basis. So hopefully next year we will have one period worked into this schedule where SAC members can meet once a week without missing a class. And I have one more thing to say. Um, we sort of meant to get this out a lot earlier for Mrs. Goldman, but I have a letter to read to you. Dear Mrs. Goldman, on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth High School Student Advisory Committee, we would like to congratulate you on your recent appointment as, su as superintendent. We recognize and thank you for your attendance at numerous school functions and look forward to working with you in the future. We realize that you've already contributed much time and energy to the betterment of our school system and are confident that such quality management of our schools will continue. It is evident that you are not only interested in our education, but in the many other aspects which create our diverse school community. We appreciate your presence. As school board representatives, we would like to personally congratulate you and thank you for your enthusiastic support. Thank you very much. I think I've received a lot of nice um, cards and calls from people I know, and I think that's one of the most deeply moving ones I've heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Communications. Connie? Okay. Um, I did include, I have one that has come in since then, but I did include uh, a couple for you. Uh, one is a copy of the notice I received from the State Maine Labor Relations Board indicating that uh, the Cape Elizabeth Educational Administrative Association has been certified, duly elected, um, and that that will start a process of negotiations, which you're, I'm sure, quite familiar with. Um, unless you have some question about that, I am simply, I included the notice in your packet and, and you're made aware of it. The second piece that I put in your packet is, it was a legislative bullet, and I think you'd probably get those anyway from MSMA, but I wasn't sure if you all got them. Uh, but there's an interesting after piece to that, which I received after I sent the packet out, so I didn't make a copy of it. Um, the legislators uh, did pass, as you see in that bulletin, some uh, wording to blunt the force of mandates. This was done because of the budget crisis at the state level. There is a good deal of pressure, apparently, from some parts of the state where um, mandates have not been fully implemented. People are concerned about trying to uh, add staff to meet mandates at a time when they're having to lay off staff in other forms. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, however, some of the legislators uh, asked the Attorney General to check the wording of that particular piece of legislation, and uh, it appears that the wording uh, is such that uh, the force of that is inoperative. In other words, um, the mandates are still on. Uh, they, uh, I don't know what the legislature will do about that, uh, since it was clearly their intent to uh, delay implementation or full implementation through passing that uh, language. But the fact that they used a threshold uh, of funding that, uh, the way in which it's worded anyway, um, it, in the Attorney General's opinion, does not, uh, is not in conflict with the actual funding level that we are now seeing, 
so that the uh, piece of legislation doesn't work. Uh, my own feelings about this as far as Cape Elizabeth is concerned is that uh, there are very few mandates that are really um, at point here because uh, the standard of class size, the standard of uh, elementary art, music, uh, library, uh, guidance services, which are usually the things that people are concerned about in staffing or adding staff, are already existent here and uh, so we're really not affected by that. The one, the pieces of uh, mandates that have to do with replacement of uh, oil tanks, those kinds of things, to the degree that we were able to um, take advantage of some delays in those uh, implementation pieces, we've already done that. Um, I think the only piece that I've heard discussed so far that might be affected by this is some of the issues of gifted and talented, but that's kind of an ongoing discussion anyway. We have some philosophical issues and some um, uh, some internal decisions to make about how uh, all of that <coughs> would be. So I don't really see the mandate as affecting that too much, but that might be. Anyway, since I, this is just, I guess, what's going on, um, after sending you the bulletin and then receiving the Attorney General's opinion, which basically says, forget the first piece, <laughs> I'm not sure where we stand, but I'm sure we'll be told at some point. And I did have a third piece that I was sent by the Teachers Association and asked to share with you. Uh, I didn't get a chance to make copies, but I, I will certainly pass this along. Um, the MTA is sponsoring a one set cent for education campaign. There is a rally scheduled for Tuesday, April 16th, um, and the MTA is asking all um, education associations to alert the school board um, administration of staff, superintendent obviously, to the fact that this is uh, an effort. Um, since there are pros and cons to it, I'm not asking you to, uh, you know, as part of the board meeting to do anything about this, but I certainly wanted to make you aware of it. So those are my communications. The superintendent's report. You're still on. I'm still on, that's right. <laughs> Okay, next issue was the, uh, and I, I put a bulletin in your packet, and for purposes of sharing with the audience, I, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll try to summarize it. Um, as I think most people in town are aware, there is a municipal proposal working its way through the various boards uh, that are involved that has to do with enlarging the municipal garage. Part of that proposal does talk about changing traffic patterns. One of the pieces would, uh, that is affected by that is to make Dean, excuse me, Jordan Way a uh, limited access road, in essence becoming a, a driveway for public safety. There would be a gate and through that gate access for emergency vehicles to the Pond Cove uh, uh, complex, but that uh, the intent would be to make that uh, cease having that as a through road. Um, in the discussion about this, it was we were concerned that there might be increase of uh, traffic coming from the high school. We noticed that uh, as high school is dismissed, there's a good deal of traffic that comes out on Route uh, 77 through Jordan Way. And uh, I have been, uh, um, had conversations with people concerned about that and talked to Mr. McGovern about it. We finally decided the best thing to do is get a group of town and school people together and go through the issues, look at the plans, and see what we could do about this. Uh, in my memo to you on that meeting, I, would, I summarized issues, and I think perhaps it might be useful for purposes of communication just to summarize those uh, quickly. Uh, certainly, I think everybody at that meeting agreed that the proposed municipal garage project is understood by all of us to be worthy of support. There is no uh, reason for us to be in anything but supportive of that particular project. We did have some concerns about the changes that I've summarized in the traffic pattern. However, we're satisfied that the uh, way in which the traffic is going to be rooted uh, should substantially prevent increase in traffic going through the Pond Cove uh, uh, complex. Uh, since I put the bulletin together, I want to emphasize that the access road between the Pond Cove um, uh, area and the high school, which will remain open, will be made a one-way traffic pattern. And the one-way will be from Scott Dyer 
down through to the high school. Uh, the reason for this suggestion is that the, uh, it, is, uh, it seems to be the time of day, if that is, if it's going to be used by high school students or uh, even uh, faculty or parents trying to use that as a cut through, it will be at a time when we don't have the heaviest traffic. That is sometime probably just before 730. So that one way going from Scott Dyer straight through to the high school uh, at the morning time would probably be convenient and we don't see it as, um, as our major concern. What it would make off uh, limits is the traffic coming from the high school back up through the Pond Cove complex and exiting at Scott Dyer. That was our major concern anyway because there has been some trouble with traffic coming through uh, and we have the little ones at the K3 complex crossing the mall, sometimes for uh, classes, sometimes for special events, sometimes for gym purposes, and uh, that can be dangerous. Um, we also agreed that we probably don't have, in fact, it's pretty obvious that we don't have the best parking and traffic pattern in that entire area. We're very imbalanced for where our, our youngsters are, with 400, give or take a few, at the high school, uh, and a lot of space around it. Uh, and then we have virtually 1,100, almost 1,200 um, crammed, if you will, into the Pond Cove uh, Middle School complex. This is a real imbalance in traffic. Uh, there's nothing we can come up with for a quickie plan that is going to solve those problems. And so one of the things we also agreed at this meeting was to ask the uh, School Space Committee to add a piece to their study of the problems at the Pond Cove Middle School complex that would look at the parking and look at the traffic pattern. For instance, we might be asking parents to be particularly careful about where they drop off youngsters and pick them up. If we could use the turnaround in the front of Pond Cove where the kindergarten wing is and use the, uh, actually the, um, to some degree I believe, we can drop off at the uh, on Scott Dyer for the youngsters at the intermediate. Um, it's possible we can even look at some use of the uh, access road and back for drop off of students at the middle school. Those are some issues that we need to discuss with and get some help from planners as far as what can we do to facilitate traffic to keep um, the flow down and to keep it as safe as possible. Uh, in summary then, uh, at this meeting, uh, speaking for myself and I think I reflect the opinion of the school people that were there, we felt that we had expressed our concerns, mainly the safety issue of traffic coming up through, particularly uh, in the direction from the high school through to the uh, Scott Dyer and going through uh, the Pond Cove uh, close to the school there. Uh, and we felt satisfied the town heard those concerns. Um, they were going to first make sure that the uh, signage was adequate and that the traffic coming out of the high school would in fact use only the exit on 77. But when the suggestion was made of a one-way street or making that access road one way, um, I think all of us thought that that was well worth a try. Um, at the time, the uh, person who had done the traffic study was there. Um, Michael McGovern asked him to review that, uh, get back to him with any problems that he saw on that so far that looks like something that is bearing up under scrutiny pretty well, and I think it's well worth a try. So, fairly complicated issue. I don't know whether I've confused you all totally, but um, that's why I wrote a memo. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. Questions? I guess the only thing I'm not clear on, are, are both entrances um, from Scott Dyer Road um, into the Pond Cove and, and Middle School Complex now going to go in the same direction? Is that? Okay, so the one, you can still loop around right. Oh yes, that part. yes. There'll still be a one way, yes. coming in and going out. Yes, in the sense of, you know, yes, exactly. Um, and that's just exactly the kind of question that will have to be carefully signed and so on. But as far as the use, the internal use of the parking lot there, Pond Cove and, and uh, the Middle School, traffic will be much as it is now. The, the issue is to not increase that traffic or introduce through traffic, particularly in the afternoon when we have had trouble with cars coming through, using the access road from the high school as a shortcut up through to uh, Scott Dyer. 
And the feeling was that when people get out of the high school, the students that drive or whatever, it wouldn't be a major traffic backup for them to only be able to go out one exit? At the present time, uh, the person who did do a uh, traffic count for the town um, is satisfied that that will work. I guess it's like a lot of other things we'll probably have to see. I'm sure we'll have some impact. That's why people are using um, the roads they're now using. Uh, on the other hand, right now, we don't have uh, large numbers of people at the school. Uh, one of the issues that um, is also involved with this, of course, are the after school, the athletic events, um, other times when people would be trying to uh, use that whole area. This is another aspect of the problem that we want to uh, have somebody really help us study. Uh, I mean, if you were building a, a school building, you would never put an access road through it. You just don't do that. You always put a school building with limited access, and you have a, usually, a, a, there's a major entrance and uh, various kinds of traffic patterns and so forth, depending on how many parking slots and bus pickup. And then you have a separate side access uh, road for maintenance purposes or to get to the back of the building for uh, bulk deliveries, those kinds of issues. But you never put through traffic through a school complex because you do have times when children are coming out or running out or something of that nature. So um, in one way of looking at this problem is how do you make Pine Cove Middle School a limited access issue? So to some degree trying to mesh our needs with what the town is doing has resulted in these recommendations. The, the town also assured us that they would create more signage, but they also assured us that they would step up enforcement. So there will be more presence of, of, of policemen there, et cetera, and uh, for those viola violators of parking, et cetera, they would be ticketed. So yeah. I think sometimes when you, when you come out from a sporting event or whatever, um, a play or whatever from, from the high school and the parking lots are full, it's going to be real interesting to see what it is going to be like to get out of there um, with only one, the one exit. True, but the the, uh, the roadway coming out of the high school to 77 will be wide, and there'll be two lanes going out, a right and a left. So that should help some of the traffic. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other concern was the busing. So um, they will have access to the high school, but they will have to come out on 77 and come around and come in through Scott Dyer come back to the middle school and uh, Pond Cove. But we don't see that as, as a problem. It's very convenient for us to have the one-way access at least. Uh, we, you know, the various things we thought about were uh, included putting a barrier so that nothing could go through there, then having a gate that could be used for emergency purposes similar to the one that's going to be at the end of Jordan Way into the uh, complex. Um, <coughs> this is a reasonable uh, plan to go forward with and to try, and I am certainly satisfied. I think we had a, a very productive meeting with the town officials, and I think that it was a, a real effort to come together with some kind of um, plan that would both support our concerns for safety and our needs to get back and forth and uh, their needs to go ahead with their plans. And I have uh, been asked by uh, Michael McGovern to go to the planning board on the 16th as a school representative. Uh, so I thought I wanted to make sure that you were all aware of the issues. I have talked to you privately about some of them, and I knew you were aware of some of them, but I thought it would be wise to put this on the agenda. So if you have any questions or any comments or any concerns that you wish me to carry forward, um, I will do so. Would you like a school board member to go with you? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'll be out of town that week, so I can ask that question. <laughs> I don't think it's necessary it's unless fairly. for some reason or other you feel okay. that you want to, but uh, I, if, if you're satisfied that I am summarizing the issues as you see fit, then I think you can let me carry on. Okay. It's vacation carry on. week. <laughs> carry on, yes. <laughs> Anything else? I did attend that meeting with Connie, and it, I felt it was very amicable in the way it was handled in a one-town concept, because we actually could stymie the whole project. 
by any objections to how they want to reroute even the road, because the road is going to change them. Do you want me to continue? Yes. Okay. Yeah, unless there's further comment. Very quickly, uh, I had a question last night with the adoption of the budget about the school bus. So those of you who were there, um, and I think we communicated this to you before, but just officially to other people aware of the fact that when we got to the uh, preliminary adoption uh, workshop on the budget, um, we had an issue that uh, uh, we had requested to borrow uh, for the bus and do it over three years, and the council uh, felt that that was not warranted and asked us to get it out of um, next year's proposed budget. Uh, interestingly enough, we did, in fact, request to do that in three three-year pattern and uh, put uh, the appropriate amount of money in the budget, uh, but uh, when we were able to get hold of the uh, gentleman of the transportation department, we found that somehow they had uh, put us down for repayment for the total amount rather than the three uh, payment that we had requested. And um, so actually that turned out in our favor. All I can say is we're, the, the concern we had that we might have difficulty getting full repayment um, it was taken care of by an accident of fate, I guess. I think it's a good example of what the word serendipity means. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Anyway. Um, had we, it, it, there's really nothing else to say except that that is uh, a done deal at this point, and we will, um, and have gone forward with the plans for purchasing it. <coughs> Obviously, we had to take money out of a contingency. Yeah, Connie, excuse me. Um, I noticed that, uh, Clint, I don't know if this is fair, but you uh, called me and perhaps several other people about this road issue. Did you want to make any comment on that? You were not here. Uh, at the beginning of the meeting, were you? If you were, I didn't see you. That's a good excuse. I accept it. Come on forward, and if you'd like to talk about that issue, we'll, if you don't mind, Not we'll at just all. reopen. Uh, yes, my name is Clint Blood, and I live at 63 Hillcrest Road. Um, I'm really concerned about the traffic pattern, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see that there's been a lot of discussion since the, uh, uh, the last two weeks. But I still have some real concerns, uh, primarily for safety of the kids as well as the safety of our public works officials. Uh, the public works officials or workers, which quite honestly I've worked with in the last four years as a, with the Fort Williams Commission, are just extremely fine people and they shouldn't be forced to work in situations which are unsafe, which is essentially where they're working now. On the other hand, I don't think that we should try to make it safe for them and increase uh, and put our children in, in harm's way. And um, so I think the, sa the safety issue is the primary issue. The second issue is location and dollars. Um, if I hear it right, is that the school board feels that there will be no need for additional space for schools and that they can see in the future. Because one of the concerns I have is if we spend $400,000 today to improve the Public Works Department in, in its present location, and then five years from now, the school decides that they need to expand the facility and perhaps take over where the bus garage is today, and the bus garage then has to move to the Public Works area, and the Public Works area then has to move someplace else, that we may end up spending twice as much in the Public Works area than if we did it correctly the first time. If, in fact, the school and you're willing to sign off, in a sense, to say that you will have absolutely no need for that area in terms of the future or for parking or whatever, then I think that's fine. But I'd hate to have, in terms of long-range planning, that five years from now or in some you know, length of time, that we do need to use that, that area. Because I think it's important, as one person told me this weekend, said, it seems like we're building our town around the Public Works Department. Well, I, you know, you can say snow plows versus children, but I don't know if it's necessarily that's the issue. But if, in fact, you're willing to sign off and go to the planning board and say, we have no use for that land, then that's fine. But I'd hate to have us spend $400,000 now and five years from now, maybe have to spend a million and a half dollars to do what might cost us a million dollars this year to take care of the public, public works and make a safe place for, for those people to work. 
The third area of concern is, quite honestly, the process where we reached uh, this evening. The, there was a municipal facilities committee that was formed that dealt with municipal facilities. And they came forth with a concern regarding the, the Public Works garage and also got into traffic control. They then went to the town council. The town council then approved a $400,000 bond issue for this with the disclaimer that the planning board would approve it. It went to the planning board. The planning board took uh, what I think the site completion is their terminology. And if they had not asked and, and, and for a public hearing, we wouldn't be discussing this issue, this issue tonight. When, after that planning board meeting, I contacted two school board people, two principals, athletic director, and one person ran for the school board, and no one knew that the uh, Jordan Way was being closed. So I have a concern as a town citizen that the left hand isn't talking to the right hand. And I don't think the Municipal Facilities Committee ever talked with the School Space Committee, as an example. Uh, and, but since that time, because and we would only thank the, public, or the, the planning board for asking for a public hearing, they are not required to have a public hearing on this issue. It was only because they, they voted to have a public hearing that we were able to discuss this. So I have a concern from the process standpoint that we, we're now having all sorts of meetings in the last two weeks regarding a very you know, large issue in terms of that affects our children. It's almost like a knee-jerk reaction to it. We're now talking about having a plan set up without really not having a traffic study done. You know, we're, we're trying out things on our kids. And I do have a concern about that. I have a concern with a traffic study that I have in terms of, uh, I understand there's been another, another traffic study done, but the traffic study that, that the town had done had a, uh, regarding the issue didn't even include the time that the elementary school is in session. And I guess I have a concern when you talk about a peak hour from 7 to 8 in the morning and that's the time that most of the information is, is dealt with that our elementary school doesn't start until 835. So that means anybody from K through 5 didn't count, or 6 out of our 13 grades weren't counted in that traffic study. In the afternoon, it's almost as bad. They, count, they started at 2 and ended at 3, which means that if you got out of the high school and got out of there in 5 minutes, you weren't part of the count in terms of the peak hour time. Or if, if you, unless you left school early on the elementary issue, at, ele at the elementary school, because they get out at 3.05, I believe, you weren't counted there either. So I do have a concern in terms of of the way that study was done. Now, and I, I fully believe that there's all sorts of ideas, and you, we've come up with one in terms of having a one-way street in terms of, of high school way. But I, I hope that we would then ask that we really have a, a real good traffic study done dealing with the issues, not necessarily at the exits and the entrances, but also what happens to those cars as they go by, especially the elementary school. The current traffic study shows that there will be a 45% increase in traffic in the morning at the high school and an 83% increase of traffic in the afternoon. At the elementary school, the numbers are 27% and 60%. The reason I give percentages is we have a high school with the lowest amount of population I think that we ever will have. There's about 100 kids per grade. Um, there's about 100 cars, high school cars, that uh, uh, students that drive vehicles to school. So if we look, and I think the elementary levels are 140 to 170, I, you, you know that better than I do in terms of number of people in our elementary levels. If in fact, in a very short period of time, we're gonna have a lot more kids at the high school. If 25% of them, which is the same percentage today, have drive cars, that means we end up with that many more vehicles. Clint, excuse me, could you uh, clarify the, uh, those percentage increases? They sure. take place over, over what period of time? Okay, and I'm, I'm taking the traffic study that I got, I received from the uh, planning board or the, the person in charge of the town planning person. And it goes from a 217 cars in the morning at the high school, they, add, they estimate there'll be another 100 cars added on to be 317 cars from seven o'clock to eight o'clock. Now I'm satisfied, you, you can take an hour's period of time. I have a question, why an hour? I think you would take the time of say, uh, 10 minutes before school and to 20 minutes, or 20 minutes before school to 10 minutes after, I think is the, the primary period of time. I, I think the averages are always averages. It's kind of like a kid that puts one foot in ice cold water and another foot in, another foot in boiling water. And he's, he has average temperature, but you know, it's, uh, you, know, you kind of ask what, what that really means. In the, in the evening, it's 91 cars 
that they have currently. With Jordan Way closed, it's going to increase by 76 cars. This is going out onto Route 77. On to, on to 77. That's, that's the numbers I'm taking right from the, right. the study. So that's an 83% increase. Now, granted, that's not a large number of cars. Uh, and Scott Dyer, I have the numbers too, that in terms of 27% and 60% going out onto Scott Dyer Road. The study does show that even with those numbers, that as far as the intersection is concerned, it stays well within the main Department of Transportation's guidelines of urban non-signalized intersections. The other question I have with that is the Scott Dyer inter intersection is unique. It's probably the heaviest traveled pedestrian in intersection we have in the town. Everyone from Brentwood walks through that intersection. Um, is that intersection compared with other urban, highly populated intersections, or is it compared with other intersections without any, any youngsters or any other people? Uh, I think those are some of the issues that I have a concern with, that if you're there, anyone is there to pick up their child in the afternoon to look at, say, a 60% increase of traffic, it gives you some questions about what's going to happen. And maybe the answer is a one-way street through um, a high school way. But do we want to just try it out? Or do you really try to get a traffic study done that will aim at what you're, we're, we're trying to achieve? This traffic study was aimed at four intersections. It was aimed at the intersection of Shore Road and uh, 77. It was aimed at the Scott Dyer and school entrance. It was aimed at the Jordan Way entrance, and it was aimed at the 77 and High School Way entrance. It really does, didn't deal at all with the issue in terms of the cars within the, within the complex. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a concern. Uh, there's one other concern I had here. Oh, um, I, I, again, I, maybe I mentioned this before. I still have a concern of why they do an hour at like seven, to, you know, from two to three or from seven to eight in the morning. Uh, why can't there be an intersect? Why can't that hour be an hour that's more appropriate to the intersection or to the time that we're dealing with? And that I really think that, as much as I've made fun of this traffic study, I think they've had some very, very good points in the traffic study. Uh, the point of putting a sidewalk down by Jordan Way, so you could so to keep the kids from walking out on the road, is excellent. The idea of 15 miles an hour is excellent. Uh, there are some other signage issues which I think are, are, are very, very good. But if, in fact, we agree and you recommend that the, that the uh, public works garage be expanded, that automatically closes off Jordan Way. So you can go through all of the, uh, the examples of how to reroute traffic, but you've agreed to the Jordan Way cutoff. And I think that eliminates some possibilities just by agreeing to the public works garage. In other words, the public works garage is a one-issue thing. If you agree to the public works garage, you agree to the closure of Jordan Way. There are some people who feel it's a two-issue situation. One is the public works garage is an issue, and the closing of Jordan Way is a second issue. But right now, the way it's being presented to the planning board, it's a one-issue situation. It's either all or nothing. So. I think that if you agree to the location of a change, then you agree to the closure of Jordan Way. And one of the recommendations, which I think you're already doing, is to have the municipal committee and, and the, the school study committee and have many people meet to come up with a plan and, and backed up by a traffic you know, plan. I mean, a year ago, we all thought we knew how to build a roof, too. And that obviously wasn't, we didn't know how to do that. And I don't know if anyone here has a degree in traffic control. I know I certainly don't. But I think we do need to have professional expertise in this regard. Uh, Mike McGovern had made a comment to me when I was in the Fort Williams Commission when I was getting rather antsy about getting things done. He commented to me and said, uh, well, Clint, you know, Cape Elizabeth has a long history of taking a long time to reach a consensus. But once we reach a consensus and make a decision, it's usually the right decision. My mother used to call it sort of haste makes waste. She had other terminology was uh, uh, many hands make light labor. And I think that if we get more people involved, we may take more time, but we'll end up with a better process that will be safe, not only for the public works people, but also for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. Why don't you stay up there for a minute in case uh, members of the board have uh, questions for you. Meanwhile, I have one for Charlie. Uh, Clint brought up the point of uh, 
the possible use of the municipal garage space. Is that anything that you and your committee, the, the school uh, space committee, have uh, considered? Is that something that uh, is knowable at this time, whether it's even on the table? It's not even on the table. We haven't even considered the use of the garage for any student population or use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was certainly a new thought to me, I must admit, and I'm glad to hear that you uh, haven't thought of it either, but uh, <laughs> is, is that, uh, has there been public comment as to that possibility that we might sometime in the future want to use that space as the, for the school and put the public garage I, I'm elsewhere? I'm not aware of any public comment until my comment this evening, but just in terms of talking with people, and mm -hmm. we're just looking at possibilities, mm -hmm. what we don't want to end up with, at my example, unfortunately, is the South Portland Municipal Pool, where they went and did it the cheapest way and ended up costing two or three times the amount for that beautiful facility that they now have. Mm -hmm. I, I would certainly hate to then spend money and then find out in a very short period of time that due to increase the population of students that we now have to increase the, because we can't build two or three story schools any longer and we have to spread out and we lose parking area and where do we go and people start looking over the municipal garage and say that's the place where we should go. Yeah. Charlie, is there any way that the, uh, that doesn't the happen, space uh, committee can function on this uh, or are you just too, it's too early in your work? I really think it's a per too preliminary uh, an issue to deal with. I mean, I think that would have to come out of of whatever engineering study of what existing facilities we have. You, you made the comment that the school board could stymie uh, this. Uh, uh, I think I'm alluding to his uh, comment that the planning board is taking it as, as all or nothing. And if the board, if the school board objected to the traffic pattern or an obstruction or cutting off of, of an access, then the planning board might take that as a, as a mixed message and might, might possibly block the start of construction of the municipal garage. But you have been functioning on this issue for some time now, or, or you've been to the meeting. Right. Do you have any inclination that we should uh, I think if I slow got, the process down or no I think what I got out of the meeting was that in the traffic study that that the Jordan way access itself is is a is a hazard because of because of the access to the shopping center so there's a lot of mixed messages of people coming turning in and out of there of which way they're going so I think there's a safety issue there also that if it's restricted only to um, uh, public safety use or or the, uh, or the uh, public garage that it will restrict some of the traffic. Well, my first reaction to this when I uh, began to focus on it, and uh, I think it was about the time you called me, Clint, was uh, to simply uh, gate it off and to the extent we need it for buses, give the, the buses uh, radio controls uh, for the gate like a garage door opener. And uh, rather than, uh, as to use your term, I'm beginning to quote everybody else, but instead of experimenting with our kids, why don't we experiment with people uh, driving the long way around Scott Dyer and 77? Is that what you would recommend? I mean, you've obviously put an awful lot of thought and work uh, into I this. I don't have an answer. I mean, I, I don't come before you with an answer saying this is what can be done. I mean, I think there's, there's an issue that you could close off Scott Dyer and make the entrance Jordan Way. I mean, I think that can, you could then you'd have a total mall area. I mean, I think that's a possibility. Uh, I'm not saying it's the answer. Well, that does, that has a difficulty because uh, the entrance to the, to the shopping mall and Jordan Way are very, very close together and that's where you get the mixed traffic message. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm saying with that would be the closure of that, the, the mall entrance. Oh, the mall entrance, And to make okay. that, put your gate that, that they've got the money for, put the gate there for a second, you know, emergency exit, expand the exit the current the major exit into the mall or by the by the IGA store to a left and right hand lane and make basically one entrance there and have one entrance at Jordan Way. I, mean, I, I think there's all sorts of different concepts which maybe the committee has already discussed uh, already uh, you know since our since the planning board but you know for example accidents you know there are four accidents at Jordan Way and Route 77. Now, I granted that's a that's a terrible intersection I'm not but there were five accidents on high school roadways and parking lots in, in, that, in this study. There were three accidents at high school way and Route 77, so there's only one more less accident at high school way and Route 77 than there was on Jordan Way and Route 77. Mm -hmm. And that's in the course of a year's time. 
So I'm, I don't see that there's a, from an accident standpoint, they're all relatively low in terms mm -hmm. of accidents. Thank God. I mean, you know. Thank you, Clint. Rosemary, did I see you raising your hand? Thank you. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I think I'm the only town councilor present. Um, I would just like to give some historical perspective just to correct the record on the public hearing on the Municipal Facilities Committee and the Public Works Garage. We did, in fact, have a public meeting and a workshop, and I'm sorry if people missed that, but that was in advance of the state. Also, I think the uh, superintendent may comment on the historical perspective of how long this plan has been um, known that this was not a surprise, although it may have become more public now than it was in the past. And I believe in one of the studies that I've read, maybe Dee LaBelle uh, can comment on uh, why the uh, school bus garage was ruled out about two and a half years ago as a consideration for anything that involved uh, school usage, having to do with, I think, the ceiling. True. And that, well, I think at that time, uh, we had looked at the building is pretty obsolete as far as bringing it back to a, a school that would accommodate classrooms because of the structure, because there are no windows, because of the... Uh, it, was, it would have been cheaper to build a new building. That's correct. Exactly. Yeah. But it, it had been discussed longer than two and a half years ago and ruled out at that point and not brought back again. But I guess the point I wanted to, to mention is there was a public uh, hearing on this issue as a town council agenda item and there was a workshop uh, during the months of February and March. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's, uh, unless there's further comment uh, on this subject, uh, does the board want to uh, follow a different course of action based on we, what we've heard than, uh, based on what we've heard than the one we originally discussed? Charlie? At that meeting, the the town is aware that we will be looking at the traffic flow and coming back with possible other suggestions if, if this doesn't work out. Um, but I can tell you, I would have closed everything off, so <laughs> kept them independent. Even tougher than I am, this, right? Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> so well, I think this is, the comp <laughs> this is a compromise. So. I think, um, again, the historical perspective is a little hard for me to be sure I'm, I'm absolutely reading it rightly, but um, my understanding in talking to administrators is that there has been some discussion over a period of time, um, both from the school's point of view to try to cut down on traffic, independent of any decisions of the, uh, of the town, um, and some discussion of frustrations with the fact that uh, people maybe it I don't want to pick on the high school students, but anyway, it does appear that it kind of <coughs> coincides with dismissal from high school. Uh, but there are others using that um, uh, access road as a kind of throughway, and, and there is nothing in the, uh, I think that's the root problem, that you have a school complex with a through road. Um, and uh, my, I also talked to, at that meeting and also later with other people about cutting off. At one point, uh, I believe uh, at least a year ago, if not two years ago, there was some generalized discussion, I understand, with the school department and a lot of issues raised about access with buses and um, and at the meeting, um, at one of our meetings, and I forget which one, uh, one of the town councilors, I think it was one of our budget workshops, one of the town councilors raised the issue of safety of uh, school buses, adding to putting the buses out on 77 more than we're now doing. Um, so there are some pretty uh, open-ended issues here, and we are living with a situation that uh, that's sort of grown like topsy over a period of time. Uh, as far as whether or not the school space study is going to come back with recommendations, um, I do firmly believe that that uh, study will pop out a uh, pretty clear profile for a need for major renovation at the uh, middle school. And we do have portable buildings there. We're going to have to make some decisions about those things. On the other hand, the amount of extra space that that building might need is very likely to be accommodated by the space that's now being used by portables um, or by other spaces immediately adjacent to the building. The issue of whether or not there would be um, uh, a clear push for another building, uh, 
I simply cannot answer that question. I doubt very much that the Space Committee can because what we are, I think, our major problem is the renovation of the existing buildings. They are not so bad that you can just push them in. Sometimes I wish that were an option, but it isn't. And uh, we have to make usable the buildings we have. I know what the state process is. I know what you go through with these discussions. I've just been through it for the last several years. Um, and we will be facing making habitable, safe, opticode, and et cetera, space worthy, um, the building we have. We, I don't believe that they're going to come back with a recommendation that you just destroy the building you have and build another one. It's possible that will come back, but I don't think so. Uh, but those are all speculative uh, pieces, um, and I certainly firmly believe we do need a good study, which is what the Space Committee is marching ahead on. We have a meeting, as a matter of fact, tomorrow. And uh, we will obviously add all of these concerns and issues to that study, and I think, frankly, that's a prudent thing to do at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I... Uh I would ask you to give some consideration to uh, if we're going to do something immediately and it's going to be an experiment, uh, I would urge you to give serious consideration or discussion to gating off the two campuses so that only emergency vehicles and school buses can use them uh, and uh, see how bad the traffic gets on 77 and, and Scott Dyer. Uh, I spent a fair amount of my life living in big cities and uh, I can't imagine it creating what I call a traffic jam. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we don't even have a stoplight in town yet. So. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. So anyway, moving right along. If it, unless Charlie, you I just have one, I have one clarification on the, the space study committee. That is a space study committee. It is not a building committee. So if you're expecting us to come back with a grandiose plan of, of, of the new fifteen of million dollar school, right. is that is not the purpose. That is not the charge, and that it's been so stated. It is so noted. I do have a concern, um, and would like a little guidance or clarification. Um, asking me to um, give consideration to gating off that access road. We we had that discussion in that meeting uh, and frankly came to the conclusion that that was not the best way to go or at least it was not the, the first thing to do. We did, as uh, Charlie mentioned, leave the meeting with a clear indication that uh, if we thought things were uh, so warranted, we would certainly come back with that, that request. But to, it, so I'm a little uncomfortable as to what I should now do. I mean, there's a planning board meeting coming up um, do, does the school board want to officially ask for a gate um, to be modifying the current plan or not? Well, I guess I'm uncomfortable with the concept of uh, trying it out to see if it works mm -hmm. uh, because the consequences of it not working are so serious. Why don't we try something that's much safer and see if that doesn't work? I just want to be clear. I mean, this is just one person speaking. Mm -hmm. I have heard, I've had a number of telephone calls, and uh, I haven't been functioning on this uh, full time on this specific issue, but based on what I've heard so far, I'm somewhat uncomfortable. And uh, when somebody like uh, Clint gets up, who's given a lot of thought to it, mm -hmm. um, it makes me pause. I, th I think there was some concern about allowing the buses going back and forth and giving kind of a mixed message to um, to, s to students or other people who, are, who would be directed out the high school way. And this was one way of keeping it open for the buses and to create at least one way that they could get between the facilities. Well, I find it hard to confuse a big yellow school bus with a passenger car. A school bus on a school campus uh, with a with a mature driver, I think, is is different. Well, I'll take that under advisement and probably get back to you. But again, this is not a formal vote, and we probably don't have enough information to um, uh, 
to ask you to do more than absorb some of the discussion that is going on. Um, and I don't have time to have another meeting with you before I go to the uh, planning board, so um, I'll probably be back in touch with you to get some clarification of that. Okay, moving on. Uh, I think we went through this. Okay, now the next little item, which we call good good news. I'm sorry. I have one question on your on your school book on your school bus. Yes. How much do we have left in our con proposed contingency plan? Um, uh, we've nailed the, the bus. The cost of the bus will be forty six eight eighty four. Therefore, we had budgeted uh, sixteen four forty for the principal plus thirty six ninety nine. We would need to adjust the contingency account by $26,745 and have a net contingency of 61647 And that's how I'm going to present it to the state as far as a budget so we get full reimbursement. And when do we get reimbursed? Where, if we, if uh, we, buy, we, buy the, we put the order in for the bus now. The bus will be in in October, pay for it then. The bus will be reimbursed uh, 80, uh, in June 92, or July? 92. Yeah, the year after. Next July. Year. It's part That's of correct. your revenue. Part of the, yeah. part of the, oh, the okay. So it's basically a cash flow problem right. at this at this stage. Yeah. It's money up front and, and you, it rolls in the year So I, I don't think it's, uh, I've been very sensitive about taking money out of the contingency fund. And I, I think that these are the only circumstances under which I'd be willing to do it when it's merely a question of a few months yeah. cash flow. But we've been slowly chipping away at that. That's why I, I wanted to know how much we had left. Yeah. Well, it's uh, one way to describe it is that we have uh, the amount that Dee mentioned uh, technically, but uh, we really have the full amount. It's just that it, part of it's going to turn up in the next year. That's right. So. Okay. The next section is uh, one that we like to do, but administratively, we always have um, a few qualms about. It's called the good news section. Uh, we've actually featured or tried to feature in um, board meetings, uh, actually things like we did tonight or awards of one kind or another. Um, and we decided we had, at this time of year, there are several things that occur. We had a couple that I'll feature right off. At the beginning, some of these things are uh, issues that the uh, student representatives have also shared with you. Uh, the trouble with good news sections on a school board agenda is that it's uh, almost impossible for us to be sure that we have included everybody. Are, are these publicized in the, in the different newsletters that go out? Some of them. I don't know about the timing. I think they, the effort is made to get them in there, but sometimes <coughs> newsletters go out at a time, you know, just between. And, and actually today at the middle school parents association meeting, they asked if we could include just a copy of the good news section, which we've just started this time in the next newsletter. So it will be forthcoming. I, it's a wonderful idea. And as I said, I, I, I really, uh, much as we love to focus these things, there is that concern that somehow there's lots of other pieces of good news that we we haven't got here. So for all those who should be here that aren't, uh, accept our apologies and we'll try to do better um, another time. We probably won't do this every single month. We'll try to collect them from time to time. Why don't we alternate uh, one month good news, the next month bad news? <laughs> well, there's always some bad news. <laughs> and if you, you leave people out on the bad news, them. they won't mind. <laughs> That's probably true. I'd like to just start with the uh, award to Barbara Powers, principal of Pine Cove Elementary School. Uh, she has received a national award uh, from the Kennedy Center School Administrator Award. This, she was uh, uh, nominated for the, uh, by the Maine Alliance for Arts Education. Uh, she was sponsored by them uh, then as a state winner and her uh, nomination packet uh, was sent to the state and she is now one of a small number of officially recognized elementary principals, uh, administrators, who have uh, received a reward for outstanding support of the arts. I also want to note that Mary Jo Thompson, our integrated arts coordinator, was involved with presenting the materials and presenting them to the Alliance. So congratulations, Barbara. Somehow I feel like we ought to have a, a, a plaque or something like that. One is coming. And um, another piece of general school uh, news. This is really to a, in the department, and actually we did include this as sort of a community.
communication in your packet last month, but I thought it would be good to add this. Um, our special education department has to go through a variety of program reviews. I've been through a number of these, uh, uh, both as a building principal and also as a superintendent. And you almost always wind up with a long list of things that you have to do. It's a, it's a pretty rigorous review. Uh, and I think it deserves, the entire department deserves credit uh, because we have a notice here from the State Department that uh, completion of the Cycle 3 Action Plan continues the status of full program approval of the special education programs within this jurisdiction. Uh, congratulations to uh, board members and staff for your work on behalf of exceptional students. Your efforts bring us even closer to the goal that all students in Maine be provided with equal educational opportunities. So congratulations to the special ed department. And um, we have a number of student things. Uh, would, would the principals like to read the, the student news from your section or would you like me to keep on going? I'd be very happy to do it, but I don't want to. I, I thought this was your part. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. I just didn't want to leave you out. Middle school. Middle school band traveled to Cape Cod. I think you've already heard of that one, but we want to make sure that everybody does. On March 25th to play at the Nelms Conference. It was a successful trip. The band has received many compliments, both written and verbal, regarding their musical ability as well as their conduct. The middle school sign course, and we heard about that earlier this evening, under the direction of Gail Parker, is going on tour the weekend of April 6th to Cape Cod, and they, we heard that they had, in fact, done this. Mrs. Benoit, sixth grade class, correspondent, scores correspondent, excuse me, Duncan Milney and Chuck Sanborn while they were serving in Saudi Arabia. Both men had returned safely. Duncan Milney was has visited with a class, and Chuck Sanborn, who is in California, has informed us he will visit with a class in his next trip to Cape Elizabeth. Two students from Janet Nesson's sixth grade class, Misty Pendexer and Colleen Minton, will make a presentation to the school board meeting on Rod Gorham, and those are the youngsters that we saw tonight. Seventh and eighth grade middle school math team. The middle school math team completed a meet with the Southern Maine Math League. At this meet, three of our eighth grade students, Jeff Sarbeck, Andy Butterworth, and Andrew Fisher, Place fifth out of approximately 130 to 150 students competing at each grade level with approximately 25 schools represented. For the seventh grade, Alec Brown placed third in the recent meet, uh, but we do not know his year's final standing as yet, but believe it will be in the top 10. Uh, seventh grader, Nick Z, placed eighth for the entire year. Mike Simpson, seventh grader, will be competing in the state geography B in Augusta on April 5th, and Alec Brown, seventh grader, is in the Cumberland County Spelling Bee and will be, and in fact has competed. And now if I remember correctly, he came in third. Mm -hmm. Yes. I forgot what he, it, the word that he misspelled, he probably never forget the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations, Al, getting to that piece. It's wonderful. I wonder if you'll ever use spell check. <laughs> <laughs> Two seventh graders recently won in the Newspapers and Education Design and Ad Contest. John Bromage won for his ad in the One Stop Party Shop, and Chris Roberts won for her ad in Small World. On March 22nd, Cape Elizabeth sent eight representatives to a regional science fair held in Falmouth. Participants in the regional fair included Lynn Powers. Topic, what is the flammability of our clothes? I wonder what the answer is. Sounds like a hot topic. Yeah. <laughs> Will Nugent topic, aerodynamics. <laughs> and Ted Schumann topic, what effect will electromagnetic fields have on radish growth? I really would like to see the result of them. Seventh grade presentations included a dual project by Jill Jansen and Jessica Freeman topic, what laundry detergents work best? Hmm. Eric Ferguson topic, an enzyme activated garbage bag. J.R. Brakely, topic, does color influence taste? And Brendan Bigos, topic, physics of hockey. I think those are wonderful topics. I mean, there's just both a combination of real life, real world interest, and I'm uh, just thinking of the various scientific principles that be involved. Middle school teachers travel to the Gray Middle School on March 13th to talk with teachers about heterogeneous grouping. Our CAPE teachers shared strategies for teaching mixed ability groups and Barbara Canal has been elected Vice President of the State Foreign Language Group. Now, I also have a, uh, a list here from the uh, intermediate, and I believe Frank will say something about the high school. Okay. 
This one now would be, I think this is mainly grades four and five, or is it K-5? K-5. K-5. Caitlin Reagan and Joe DiOrio were honored by the Lions Club for participating in their National Peace Poster Contest. Mark Toothaker, a Lions Club representative, brought pizza and soda for lunch. Art teacher Claire Ruthenberg joined Mark, Caitlin, and Joe in celebrating. Uh, the Odyssey was a tremendous success from kindergarten to fifth grade at Pond Cove. The murals done by Pond Cove students on their undersea Odyssey are displayed in the Pond Cove cafeteria. The middle school cafeteria has the murals painted by the fifth grade students from their Odyssey of American History, and both spots have been transformed. I do urge you to stop by. They are absolutely wonderful. And I have a, an under-the-sea mural in my office, which is absolutely spectacular. It's, it just transforms the office. Uh, Cape Elizabeth TV will broadcast fourth and fifth grade classroom presentations so that families may make copies. I have a copy of the date. Those dates are going to be on TV when they're going to be. Uh, I'll just read them quickly, but alert people to the fact that if you did not see some of the presentations that individual grades did, they will be on cable TV April 20th and 21st, fourth grade, April 22nd, and American Odyssey Part 1, uh, April 23rd, and American Odyssey Part 2, and April 24th, and American Odyssey Part Three, and those times appear to be all at the 4 and 7 p.m. time slots. But I'm assuming that if you missed any of that and you want to see them, there'll be uh, information on the uh, cable TV. On June 7th, 8th, and 9th, the Cape Elizabeth Special Olympics team will be heading to the University of Maine in Orono to participate in the Special Olympics Summer Games. They'll be awarded medals for such events as the 50, 100, and 200 meter run the running long jump, swimming, and the softball throw. Participants will be Aaron Shaw, Mike Grindell, Angie Madison, Jill Digman, Matt Dunham, Brian McBride, Caitlin Madison, Brian Pierce, and Nicole Gagney. Uh, Jill Digman has been nominated to represent Cape Elizabeth in the National Special Olympics Games held in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She'll be there from July 19th to July 27th, accompanied by her teacher, Teresa Cameron Raymond. And finally, the winners of the 1991 Flame Poster Contest were announced and awards presented. Three Pond Cove Intermediate fifth graders, Mirgan McVean, Ryan Maskovich, Erica Sandler, were state finalists in the elementary division. Ms. McVean was awarded second prize, Ms. Sandler third prize. They are students of French with Suzanne Janel. The theme for this year was Peace Through Understanding. Excellent thing. And the high school. Part of the uh, the high school mentioned, uh, excuse me. Part of the high school report is was given earlier by our student uh, board members, who uh, I think talked about the speech and debate finalists, both in the national finals. But I think more important is there there are about 50 students who participate in our speech and debate activities, and they work very hard and they work together. And I I think it would be um, important to emphasize that, that the, the process they go through uh, of working with each other and with their coaches um, is probably far more important than the individual winning. Nonetheless, there are approximately 10 students who qualified either as um, outright contestants in the nationals or alternates. And um, I think Jen and Lori mentioned the, the, the winners. Some of the alternates include Lindsay Norris, Peter Hand, Leah Parker, uh, Lucy Fowler, Josh Broussard, and, and Dan Berman, who is also a, a contestant in another category. Two of our students, Ryan McFall and Kendall Wyman, are going to be the Southern Maine regional entrants in the Spear Speaking Contest. They'll go to Bangor uh, th tomorrow for the state finals. In addition, uh, 11 students qualified for the Nationals of State Championship debate, which is something we will not attend this year. We are, I think, attending the, the National Debate Tournament, which is, I believe, in Chicago. Is that right? And, and uh, th there's another national tournament in Bowling Green, Kentucky, to which the, the team is not going to go. But it's been a very successful year for, for the debate team and for the speech contestants. There are a number of students who are going to participate in all state music. Um, and we have this year nine students who will 
go to the festival, which I think is held in early May. Coleman Gray and Lindsay Norris, John Woodward, Raina Bartlett, and Megan Wilson will be vocal uh, participants. Uh, Dottie Hall will, will um, go as a French horn player. And three violinists, Shelley Stevenson, Ginger Brown, and Sarah Safer will participate. Uh, we also have a very successful jazz combo. Um, and one of the players in that combo, Tom Aldrich, was the jazz piano player in, in the Allstate and was the, the winner in that category. In addition, the combo itself was the state champs in the uh, contest, I think it was two weeks ago. Tomorrow night in our auditorium, um, the stage band and the jazz band will be putting on a concert and uh, the public and the school board superintendent and anybody else who would like to come should should plan to attend. Um, I think with that and with what the high school board reps uh, gave you earlier, you have sort of a rundown of some of our accomplishments that have, have occurred in, in fine arts amongst other things with uh, the play, the music, and the speech and debate. Thank you. That's our good news report. And um, I'm going to go very quickly over the last couple of items here because we've taken quite a bit of time on this. I simply wanted to let you know, let the board know that um, there really are some remarkable um, opportunities now through the UNAM grant, through the partnership, main partnership, and, and we are trying to take uh, advantage of them. As a matter of fact, we have some of our administrators involved with a meeting that's going on tomorrow. Is it tomorrow or Thursday? Tomorrow, right? I know because it, tomorrow, tomorrow I not only miss the jazz concert because we have a space meeting, but uh, I also have some other commitments too. But anyway, um, the uh, where they some of them are sharing assessment issues as um, experienced here in this uh, district with other districts. Uh, recently, I was at a meeting that Unum hosted to uh, begin to explore with superintendents the possibilities of some ties and uh, management ties to dealing with um, uh, some of the efforts they're doing for total quality management. It's an exciting concept. UNAM is, of course, a service organization, which uh, when we're looking for help from business, um, from the standpoint of staff development training and procedures, uh, a service organization is actually a lot closer to the nature of schools than perhaps a certain a factory or um, a, uh, an outfit that is dealing with uh, producing something. Uh, so I, you'll hear more about that, but I just want to let you know that these things are going on. Um, and I have talked to some of you at least about a meeting coming up on the Common Core. This is a meeting that the State Department is uh, urging a group of us to pull a group together from the uh, uh, school community to sit down to look at that document which the state uh, recently published. My last point, uh, I have sent a letter to all candidates for the school board um, inviting them to come in and talk to me or also to uh, meet with me informally next week just to talk about uh, and share some material that I have on duties of school boards and so forth. Um, after we uh, reorganize this year, we will be going from five to seven num members. We will have um, some specific issues to deal with, and I will be looking forward to uh, planning and working with you for orientation for new school board members and for reorganizing under those. So I just want you to know that I'm thinking of you. And that's my report. Good. Thank you, Connie. The board chairman's report is blank on the agenda. However, <laughs> <laughs> nobody can accuse me of grandstanding. Uh, I do want to comment on the fact that last night the town council uh, approved the town and the school budget and this ended a long and arduous process for everybody which was characterized by a lot of hard work, teamwork, and people pulling together rather than pulling apart. And many people participated in this process, uh, staff, the board, community teachers, administrators, uh, far too many to name, so I'm not going to try, but I think you all know who you are, and I just want to uh, say thank you for all your efforts uh, 
I hope that uh, this is indeed the end of the budget process for this year and that there's not some something lurking out there in the future uh, in Augusta. I, I really don't think there is, but it's always a possibility. So again, thanks to everybody who participated in this process. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, and it is also uh, an item that is blank. Is there any unfinished business that we should be considering tonight? Then we'll move on to new business. Uh, the first item being the discussion of the 91-92 school calendar. Connie, do you have any particular comments on that? The only comment I, I really just want to emphasize, this is a, uh, a first reading, if you will. Um, the process for calendar requires us to um, give you some time to work on it, but also to uh, have an advise and consult with the Teachers Association. Um, the board does, in fact, set the calendar, but the process does call for us to have some discussion and involve the Teachers Association for a uh, response and uh, then to bring it back to you. Um, frankly, this calendar looks a lot like the current years. I've already received some comments from people who have had a chance to look at this, uh, and some suggestions have been made principally um, in at least some of the months possibly changing the Wednesday released afternoons to Friday to facilitate some uh, possible uh, weekend plans of uh, parents. Um, I don't have any great recommendations for you. Um, we have 181 days in our calendar. Um, I have learned over almost 30 years that 181 days is 181 days. It almost doesn't make too much difference where you put them. But it is, uh, I recognize a time when there are apt to be a lot of different opinions and at some point we adopt a calendar. So unless somebody else has strong recommendations, I will say that this calendar has been reviewed by the administrators. Uh, it is substantially, as I said, like the one you passed last year. Um, and we're waiting for your comments. Okay. Charlie? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, I have comments on two of the months, um, January and April. Uh, in, in January, since the teachers come back uh, the second and third uh, for full teacher workshop days, I, I question the need for the half day on the 15th that month. And, and in April, I get concerned because it's the same thing this year, where conferences occur in April, a week's vacation occurs in April, and I realize that, that the half day for teachers is not the same as conferences and is not the same as vacation, but when you add that in for the students and the parents, it's an awful lot of days out of school in one month. Okay. Charlie, you had a comment? We finally arrived at a format last year for handling half day, half day workshop type days. I just, some evaluation from the administrators of the success of finally finding something. How did it work? I would, um, in a word, summarize them as critical. Uh, at some of our uh, grade levels, uh, and, and this isn't true all the way up through the system, and we can speak to differences in different schools, there, there is no other common planning time available to teachers, period, um, for access to each other for curriculum. And the, the feedback you would find from teachers, and if you're truly concerned about you know, the amount of time off or, or the success of this program, I would. <laughs> I would really encourage you to directly talk with some teachers who will tell you that it's um, about life-saving at this point in our programs. And I do appreciate your concerns, Jan, and when we look at this calendar, certainly it, it appears to have some, some bumps and slowdowns in timing at all, but um, looking at January, for example, yes, we come back and we do fairly programmed stuff with our teachers those two days. This year, for example, if I can think back, we did um, one whole day on straight curriculum planning for the Odyssey unit so that we didn't need to do any of those release 
times like we've done in previous years to be ready for Odyssey. And the other day we did some real pertinent building level issues around uh, things that had arisen during the year around staffing and programming, et cetera. So it was highly programmed time. On the release afternoons, by and large, I have, um, uh, well, I can't think of the word, I'm tired. <laughs> I've committed to the teachers that that will be uh, grade level time, that they will set their agenda, that they will meet, and meet they do for hours. Uh, in January, yes, we're back for two days, and yes, they can have some grade level time then, but without the 15th, they would go one, two, three, four, five, six weeks or four weeks or whenever you'd put the 12th before they could meet again. And the routine that we have tried to guarantee for them is the ability to get together uh, in grade levels every three to five weeks, and that's pretty much how you'll find those Wednesdays arising. So I would tell you they are in incredibly valued by the elementary and intermediate staff, and I would encourage any of you to talk with teachers directly for specific examples. Maybe maybe I miss I can't count, but maybe that time of the day, and it's perfectly normal. <clears throat> I count ten half days. Mm -hmm. And then I count six additional days for workshops. So we don't have six teacher days. We actually have 11. Does that make sense? The, the, whenever you're in session, more than half the hours that we meet, it's counted as a complete day. Oh, it is? Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. but, we, but, but in actuality, regardless of how we count it, we're still looking at Ten half days of, of time plus six six full days. Of if I can if I can walk you back about three years, um, the elementary school is the first school that that tried this half day. Well, this early release concept. It used to be an early release by two hours. Um, three years, four years ago or so, that coincided with the time we added half an hour of instruction to every day. And, and what the elementary teachers counter proposed was we are happy to meet with children uh, an extra amount of time and that results in about five hours every two weeks. Please give us two of those hours for planning. And that's where the concept first arose and for a long time we went out every two weeks for two hours. Uh, at the bequest of the, uh, at the behest, I'm sorry, of the community, we, uh, and, and not with some negotiation, I might add, with teachers, we changed that to, to um, more of a once a month commitment so that families weren't as disrupted with child care issues as they were when it was an every other week occurrence. But it was, it did come at a time when instruction was in, in fact increased by three hours every two weeks and that was one of the things the teachers asked for. I think one of the things to keep in mind too though is that you know based on community input and all um, I, I think in order to keep the half days going that you know which is is more damaging to maybe in April cancel one half day and keep everything else intact or make people upset that so kids are out of school so much of the time and jeopardize mm -hmm. the entire I, I hear you, Jan, and it's a fine line, frankly, for me to, uh, to, to and I really do try, and I, and I think um, Nancy and Frank do also, really keeping parents up to date about what, what we're doing with that time. I've had parents say to me that they're very clear on how time's being used, and I do give, I have not directly heard a single comment this year, and I lay a big piece of that to community services and their efforts to offer options for young children for things to do on that afternoon. Yeah, but I have, and I heard especially the fact that we had two solid weeks of Christmas when everybody else was back in school mm -hmm. around us. Mm -hmm. on we that didn't lose two days Friday. because of that, though, John. We simply go later in June because of that. I'm just talking about from a scheduling standpoint. It's mm -hmm. very. Difficult. I heard a lot from parents this year when they said, mm -hmm. "I can't." You know, mm -hmm. I can't take two weeks off, or I can't find child care for my kids because mm -hmm. all the other schools around us are back in session the day after New Year's. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when you look, and I have to agree with Jan, you've got the same situation this month where you've got um, in Pond Cove in the middle school, we've got uh, parent-teacher conferences going on. We've got a half a day tomorrow. We've mm -hmm. got a week off next week. It's It's a very... I understand all the time is needed. Yeah, and we it's, real a, hard it's the a tight row it's between very disruptive. child care issues and critical teacher planning needs. And it, at some point, I'd really like to have a very long discussion with you about the equity of elementary teacher planning time with their colleagues in this district. And the teachers in our level are adamant about 
being recognized for, for need for time. And, um, and, and that's, all, that's what I can share with you, as their representative, share with you that, that you would hear as much emotion from the teachers around this issue as you hear from parents. And um, you know, that's, that's the best I can yeah. represent them for. I, I hear it both ways uh, from mm -hmm. parents, but I uh, just had the opportunity last week to spend uh, the entire week with a sixth grade teacher, and lest that be misunderstood, she's my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did hear repeatedly during that time how, she's a first year teacher incidentally, uh, how important you know, it is for her to be able to spend mm -hmm. time with other teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I, as, as John uh, suggested, uh, couldn't we do something to be more in step with the surrounding communities? I mean, what is the difficulty in, a, in achieving that? Oh. If indeed we are out of step, I don't know precisely those figures. Yes, ma'am. I wish I had a nickel for every hour the local superintendents have sat talking about the calendar. Usually the, the issue that gets um, this gets centered on is a calendar for vocational schools because there's 17 communities that send to the vocational school. Uh, and if you have a significant number of youngsters, or frankly, if you send anybody, uh, you try to keep your calendar somewhat in sync, although there are, it's a absolutely impossible to have some of these uh, situational things like workshop days. Uh, most, uh, I'm not aware of any district that does anymore that doesn't give release time. I think that there are some that give more, some that might give a little less. Um, I, and again, going back to my comment about trying to meet with business people and look at business management issues, I always remind people that we are in, an, in a somewhat unusual circumstance. Um, we need to confer with each other. I certainly don't want to be operated on by a surgeon who hasn't conferred with his fellows, nor do I want my legal cases handled by a lawyer who does not regularly confer with his colleagues. Um, teachers also are responsible for custodial aspects. People do not want us turning children over to untrained substitutes. Um, people obviously care about the personality and the skill of an individual teacher. Uh, and we also have professional responsibilities. This is an enormously complex mix of needs. But I can assure you that there is simply overwhelming research, if you're interested on the need for teachers to confer. And I just suggest that every time I go to a business meeting, people are there who are a whole department of staff development who plan staff development internally for everybody in that organization. Um, it may not be more than a couple of weeks a year, but it may be two full weeks from their regular job. Um, and uh, admittedly, teachers have the summer, and many of them do take advantage of going to school in an extended period of time. But the kind of conferring that we're talking about here is a kind of conferring that is essential during the school year. That is, what are we going to do with a particular curriculum and a particular unit and a particular group of children? And frankly, conferring in July about what went on last, uh, last January um, can get pretty uh, long term. It is, it's possible, and it does have its uses. This is a very difficult issue. I haven't been through this discussion with you, and I don't want to do anything more than support the, uh, the need. I've been through the discussion in other communities, and I hear uh, other concerns. I think we do need to reach out to the community uh, and try to arrive at the best compromise we can. But those are the issues that I think we need to be aware of. I don't, I don't think anybody is, is debating the importance of, of half days in general. I'm talking about one half day in the month of April. Right. Good point, Jane. That's true. And, and uh, if you if you are the parent of a sixth grader, as I am, then uh, you have Chewonky, and you realize that uh, there aren't a whole lot of uh, days in April. Right. But I, I just uh, just to sort of continue on, and just like a couple of things from the middle school with our our half days in the middle school, um, we've had a discussion about would half days or full days serve our needs better, and the faculty. I'm not sure what the split would be on percentage. But one of the concerns with full days is that that then adds other days to your calendar. Because with the half days, as Barbara explained, if you're there for over half of your school day, you can count it as a day of attendance. Um, you take a full day out for a teacher workshop, and that becomes a teacher workshop day, but not a student attendance day. So um, that's one of the considerations. Um, also, 
just in support of the idea of the, of the half days too, a couple of things to remember that we've done over the last couple of years, and some of them for budget reasons. Um, several years ago, we used to be in the habit of pulling grade levels out or groups of teachers out during the year to do some curriculum work. Um, we have not done that this year. Uh, we have had teachers stay in their classrooms as much as possible um, and not provide the substitute coverage for those kinds of in-service days here within this district. And also we've had to reduce our summer curriculum work um, because of budget reasons. So therefore, some of the workshop days that we have on our calendar can begin to answer some of those needs for us and um, our need to keep those in there. From our point of view in the middle school, we've used these days this year, especially the ones that happened oh, from November, December, January. That's a lot of the time that we spent um, developing our budget and working together as a school, um, having time away from classroom responsibilities, and we could really work on the budget together as a school and not just separate entities in a school, but as a whole school together. And I think that helped us throughout our entire budget process. Uh, we are now at a point where we can turn much of that time back over to our teams. Um, our teams do have common planning time in the middle school this year. Next year they have less common planning time because of our reduction in allied arts time and they're going to be using that for instructional time. So some of these afternoons will become critically important to them as well. We have also discussed in the team leadership today the same question about the April workshop. You would hear that from middle school teachers. And you would also hear a question about the June workshop from middle school teachers. And I would certainly encourage you to talk with those people and find out some of their input um, on workshop days specifically, other than what I've been able to represent today. And two, I know Frank wants to bring you up to date in the high school, but also Sue Gabriel from our Parents Association is here. At some point later, she has some input from the parents, and um, she wanted to be sure that I noted to you that she'd like to speak tonight. Before, before you wander off and Frank talks about the high school, because I know this doesn't yes. affect him, if you just looked at the November calendar, for example, yes. on November 11th, we have, what's that, Veterans Day? Yes. Then we, f we have two days of, of class, then we have a half a day, and then we have no school for teacher conferences. Right. Is, there, is the 14th and the 15th a magic number? I mean, if you were to move that back the week before, that would at least um, give you... It, it helps us a little bit with when the first term ends. If we moved it back, you mean to the 7th and 8th? Right. I don't think that would throw us off particularly, no. It just comes very close to we had moved the October date um, from the 16th to the 23rd so that we could have a four-day school week, the week of Columbus Day, I believe that's the thing. That those would put those two workshop weeks rather close together. Um, something to consider. We also, John, if, if you look at, no, we've had Novembers before where there haven't been five-day weeks. And we, and we tried to be very careful to have interruptions happen in two out of four instead of four out of four. So um, the conferences were in fact pushed back a week to coincide with Veterans Day weekend. And as we did this year to have the release day prior to Thanksgiving holiday, which for many families was a blessing so they could hit the road a little earlier. So we did that again. That doesn't allow the staff a blessing, but it does allow mm -hmm. families to get going. And that's why um, they're clustered at those two weeks instead of spread out a little more. That was our logic, I mean, it, we meant, okay. as we saw it. And just one other comment too, first at the middle school this year, the two days in January really helped us with our attendance coming in the next Monday, with most of our student body being back from any kind of vacation or holiday. In the past, when we have started on those days shortly after New Year's, we've had a large percentage of students still be absent because they were on some kind of a family vacation. And when we opened, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but we had very fine attendance when we opened that Monday. Um, so that worked very well for us this year. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, I would like to echo some of the, the same uh, su support for this calendar that Barbara and Nancy have given you. But I, I would add that for the high school, uh, both this year and, and, and next year, it is particularly useful to have those half days. We have been working this year on a, uh, trying to develop outcomes in, in our departments and for courses uh, under the grant that we got from the Coalition of Essential Schools. Next year, we, we will continue that work, but we will also begin working on our self-evaluation for the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. These, both these projects take a lot of time. They require a, a substantial number of meetings of the faculty and, it's, and, and of departments, and it's not easy to always get those 
meetings in after school given the diverse activities that our, our faculty are involved in. We have a number of faculty members who are coaches. Uh, they're involved in extracurricular activities and it's simply not easy to just arrange that. I, I think also that um, I, I would want to encourage you to, to think about the, the notion that we need the planning time during the year. I know Connie just mentioned that, but I think it's very important that we get on a regular basis some time to work as a group. Teaching is a, a sort of one of those ironic situations where you're surrounded by people all day, but you rarely have time as adults to sit down and meet with each other. And I think it's very important for us to have in the calendar some time set aside to, to do that. And unlike private businesses where you can sometimes schedule that or, or remove people, when we do remove people for a meeting or a series of meetings, if school is going on, we have to get substitutes, people have to plan for those disruptions, and it's frequently um, uh, a little bit complicated. So I too would, would urge you to uh, support this notion of half release days, which works at least from the high school's point of view quite well. I, I appreciate that there are problems with parents and work schedules, but um, we, we are able to get a lot of constructive work done. I, I appreciate that, and I, and I don't mean to get on a, a, a tangent here tonight, but I, if you're going to use the term private business and compare education to private business, there are many meetings that I go to at 6.30 in the morning and have breakfast meetings. There are many meetings that I'm there till 8.30 at night. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, and my job still gets done between 8 and 6 during the day. And uh, if it needs to be done, it gets done outside the confines of the normal duty of uh, what I have during the day. So if you're gonna if you're gonna make that comparison, I, I would also I would I agree with that, John. There, there, m many teachers have a long work day too. Some I, of which you see and some of which you don't. I appreciate so that. I, Nobody so appreciates I think, that more than I do. Yeah. All right. But I, so I think it's it's sort of both there. We, we simply have very little time sometimes to to work together, um, and this is uh, an opportunity to do that. And um, the high school starts at, at 7.30 in the morning. Many people are there at 6.30, 7 o'clock working already. So I'm, I'm with, with you on that score as well. Charlie? With the reduction of a curriculum director and a drastic reduction in, in summer workshop time, I'm totally in support of any time we can give the teachers during the year to work on curriculum. And I think they're going to need it. Thank you, Charlie. Sue, would you like to uh, address this issue? No, you have to come forward where we can see you on the television. This is going to be replayed 11 times in the next month. <laughs> At the um, middle school parents uh, associating meeting this morning, we had um, quite a discussion about this. And our point was not the validity of the days off, but maybe a possibility of changing a few of the days, as Connie said, to the days before vacation. But I guess our point was that the, the days before vacation, the kids are a little itchy, and you've kind of lost a few of them anyway, even if they're physically in the school. So we thought maybe if we if we would consider putting, I think there were four, um, that coincided with or came near a vacation time uh, or long, there was one with a long weekend. I wrote a, we, we all wrote a letter that I'll give to you, but um, if, they, if we could try like four of those that would uh, butt a vacation and four that didn't, then maybe next year we could evaluate better how that would work out as far as the attendance. And then uh, there was a comment about whether um, that would kind of make uh, the days before vacation seem less important, but I, I don't think that was really, some of, some of the people there thought that that wouldn't really be a problem, that they'd be more apt to send their kids and then just get off early wherever they were going. Mm -hmm. Anything I left out here. <laughs> so, I, I guess it was the point about the kid, the receptiveness of the kids and the quality of the education of the time that you're taking out might be better quality for the, for the students if we did it on those Fridays rather than on the Wednesdays. And it would also give a little more continuity, you know, instead of having a day here and a couple days in and a couple days out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> would uh, anybody like to comment on that, uh, that point, Connie? 
I'm very neutral on that. I mean, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I can see, you know, good, good. Uh, well, I can see the argument both way, but I'm I'm perfectly willing to support them. Any further comment on the subject of the calendar? Then we'll move on to uh, personnel requests. Okay, the calendar will re return next month. Right. And any information I've gleaned from or any other suggestions, we'll try to put this together, take into under advisement and review. So, um, next item, personnel requests. Uh, mentioned in your packet, uh, one is a request for child care leave uh, from uh, Laura Giverts, art teacher at the high school. Uh, would be a child care leave for the fall semester, the 91-92 year. Uh, at the present time, she's intending to come back at the second semester. Obviously, this is a, a leave that she is entitled to through contract. And uh, the second personal issue is a, uh, an appointment of a special education teacher, uh, Suzanne LaHaye, part-time for the remainder of the school year. Uh, to take care of a special need which has arisen, which I outlined in the past. Mm -hmm. Could we have a motion uh, on both those issues? So moved. Second? It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the K-12 substance abuse policy. First reading of this new policy, and I would like to ask uh, Charlie Greer to describe in as much or as little detail as uh, he thinks appropriate uh, how this new policy is different from the old policy which is presently in place. Okay, first I'm gonna give you a little background of why this, this happened to arise this year. There was a, uh, a letter that came out of the Department of Education and Cultural Services concerning the drug program certification requirement for drug-free school funds. And there were certain requirements that had to be met in order to, to qualify for those funds with, which helped to fund a lot of our, our drug-free school activities. Um, in review of those, those um, requirements, we met all of them and in part um, the only area that we really were a little deficient was that we really had no system-wide student substance abuse policy. Uh, we had fragments of a high school um, school and high school rules and an athletic rules and regulations type policy, but that's about all we had as far as a total <coughs> system-wide student uh, policy. Um, and so I came before you last fall with a, a recommendation that the community team was willing to undertake this and to, to write a policy and come back to you. And that's, that's what we have done. Um, essentially, the uh, employee and student policies were initially looked at to, to kind of base them on a disease type concept and a education type concept. And the first agenda was to kind of develop a general preamble or statement to forward all policies and administrative guidelines pertaining to substance abuse. And in the, in the specific policy that we're, we're now um, reviewing, which is the student policy on alcohol and other drug abuse, the statement of policy on alcohol and other drug abuse is, has, a, uh, has essentially a uh, a <clears throat> forward, which is which, which will be seen also on the suggested employee, and this was essentially to address um, the Cape Elizabeth School Department recognizes that alcohol and or other drug dependency are treatable diseases. In order to ensure the highest possible standards of safety, health, and well-being in a working learning environment. The school board is committed to aiding students and employees in seeking help to correct possible alcohol and or other drug dependency problems without fear of penalty. The Cape Elizabeth School Board, recognizing that chemical involvement must be dealt with at many different levels from pre-experimentation -exper through chronic dependency, charges the administration with developing and monitoring procedures to provide the following. 
One, prevention education. Two, identification of the harmfully involved. Three, immediate intervention. Four, referral for treatment. Five, support services for the involved, the concerned, and the affected. And six, staff training. Um, our suggestion was in order to fulfill the requirements of the drug-free schools certification uh, and in order to receive federal funds, uh, there were four things that had to be in place. Um, appropriate drug education programs for students, a statement or policy with respect to student drug use, a statement or policy with respect to employee drug use, and um, a biennial review of our drug-free programs. Um, since essentially we had no formal policy but just fragments of some type of administrative and it just seemed to, to, uh, to pertain mainly to the high school, it was felt that we needed some type of a formal policy. The second recommendation was once this formal policy was accepted was to work with administrators to develop consistent and age appropriate administrative guidelines in both the high school, middle school, and elementary to go along with this policy. Hey, thank you, Charlie. This is a very complete job, and uh, it's very clear, but between now and the next meeting, uh, members of the public uh, have the opportunity to comment on this uh, and come to the meeting. Uh, I think as a technical matter, we have to waive the reading of it verbatim. Uh, is that the will of the board? And will we give wide circulation of this uh, to make sure that uh, the community is aware of this new uh, draft and have an opportunity to comment if they want to? I think that we can certainly send it to our parent associations as well, of course, to the entire staff and ask for their help in um, taking a good look at this. Uh, and any, uh, we certainly could have some available in the town office. I, uh, I've seen the um, where we also have put up the, um, the little leaflets on safe homes. That must be a community team, team response and so on. Uh, I'm not sure that we need to tack a draft policy there, but we might at least make in some of those places make that available. Well, Charlie, has the community team uh, given wide <laughs> circulation to this? Uh, uh, the community team did review it. They did make a, one recommendation on the student policy and we incorporated that change. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of this was a first reading on a new employee policy and at this time I would like to table that because I have some reservations with, um, I don't want to go against my committee, but in, in retrospect and in, in rereading this, we have a current policy in effect which is the same as the town on employee mm -hmm. statement of policy on alcohol and drug abuse. And um, it seems to be a little more forward and straightforward in, in its presentation. And I really feel that the employee policy that's being suggested is a little muddled. And I would like to, to take that back to a rewrite. Does everybody agree with that, that we table this? Yeah, again, I think that uh, it is such an important and sensitive issue that there uh, be wide circulation of it before we adopt it. And uh, uh, certainly with the employees, we could reach them quite easily by simply putting it in their boxes or their pay packets. And, um, and also it will be up for a policy such as these that has the potential of uh, touching various legal issues, I'll ask the board attorney to review it. Yes, yeah, good. I, I think if there was anything that we're putting forth as, as, as strong consideration is this kind of uh, broad statement of policy, uh, kind of like a preamble to any kind of administrative type thing. Good. Do we need a formal vote on the first reading? No. It's just... Okay, and the employee's uh, policy is then tabled. Uh, the next item is the ratification of the PRVTC 91-92 budget. Uh, I'm not sure in looking at your previous minutes whether this is an item that you're familiar with, and it's a very small item, but it is a technicality, and I thought I should clean it up. I think it has come up every year. Has it? Uh, is that your recollection? 
Don't go find me. I thought you had a photograph. No, 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 no. I, I think we have some things. Yes, right. and in fact, I think I'm on the committee that. Uh, uh, in essence, what it amounts to is that we are not responsible for a portion of their their main budget, but the 17 sending schools some years ago agreed to picking up upfront costs for replacement of materials and uh, and new programs, which is simply prorated depending on how many youngsters are sent in the given year. Um, so that uh, since we don't send many, our, our budget item is fairly small, but um, it is a technicality. Uh, it amounts to our share for next year is $1,549. Uh, uh, I certainly recommend that you uh, vote on it. It was in court, included in our budget. It was in the line of the budget we did mention in passing, and I had a call from the director of the institute asking for the minutes signifying your vote, and I said, whoops. <laughs> well, then do I hear a, uh, a motion that we ratify uh, this uh, budget of the PVR, PRVTC? I move that we, that we ratify the budget of PRVTC for 1991-1992. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yes. How many students do we now send? Do you have any idea? At that rate, it must be very few. I think it's four or five students. Yes, yeah, so it would only be... How often do they go? They go every day. Every day. Yeah, they, they're in our school in the morning and they leave for PRVTC about it, 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 and actually, I, I, think there, I think there's probably about seven or eight this year, but I'm not sure that that's the same number as next year. So are these services that we do not offer in our own industrial technology program? Right. <laughs> They're able to, to avail themselves of some very fine technic technical programs at the Regional Vocational Center. Um, that we simply we don't offer nor do most of the high schools and so that the states focus their efforts there wonderful ones in food services um, uh, auto auto body um, computer technology uh, just a, a whole range of, of things that are just very good options and we would like to see more students do it and encourage as many as we can but we we have a small number each year who go it is a beautiful facility. It's a wonderful that facility. That is also underutilized. That's right, but um, I think that I think part of that underutilization is also the, that we're all at the bottom of that in high school age of that population curve. So, thank you. Any further uh, discussion? All in favor? The final item on the agenda is the consideration of the superintendent's recommendations for coaches for 1991-92. I think all of you have a list in your packet. Uh, there are some blank spaces. Uh, those would be filled by appointment, I yes. gather, at, uh, as uh, people are found for those positions. Uh, can we go right to the motion, uh, Connie, or do unless, would you like to discuss yes, it? Yes, I think you can. This is, unless for some reason or other you wanted to, it's a fairly long list, and, and I don't think there are any surprises on it, but it, you're the people that vote on it, so you've seen it and you've had a chance to look at it. Any uh, questions on that? Uh, no, I move that we uh, accept the superintendent's recommendations for coaches for the years 1991 and 1992. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Just a just a comment. <laughs> it's it's funny where freshman boys soccer uh, was one of those that was recommended as a possible cut, and we don't even have a coach. Uh, just to Maybe that's inside. the reason. The coach this year was David Perry, and he uh, did a wonderful job. Um, he is, uh, on the other hand, next next year unable to continue in that, and that's the only reason it's it's there. It had nothing to do with the cut. He would like to do it at some other point in time, but um, it's just uh, a not a, not a fall. He's going to be able to work that into his plans. I just wanted to clarify that in case we have anybody who would like to volunteer and please get in touch with the athletic director, especially where we reinstated that program. Okay, it's uh, been moved and seconded. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor? Mr. Chairman, before we adjourn, I, I forgot to ask one quick thing up, up higher on the agenda. Um, yeah, one of the budget meetings, we talked about scheduling a workshop to talk about gifted and talented at some point. And, and I would still like to schedule that workshop, but instead of framing it as gifted and talented, I would like to frame it 
as a workshop to discuss um, high expectations across grade levels for all students and how we can achieve that. Do you have any time frame in mind? Just sometime before the end of the year. Okay. Well, I, li I like the terminology. And uh, let's find a date. I think this would be an interesting one to pull in with some of the information from the coalition. Um, uh, the idea, I don't know how much you were exposed to their um, philosophy last year when you first talked about it, uh, so that uh, it's, it's a terrific topic. That's uh, the, the only thing that uh, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, how do we cover that in two hours? But well, with so a lot of preparation, I think is the uh, <laughs> is the answer. And maybe maybe we don't. Maybe the, I mean I I have heard about this over and over and over again since I've been on the board. Maybe it's an ongoing year-long topic that needs to be explored through a series of workshops. This would be a wonderful time to get feedback from the community. Um, also, I mean, I would really invite people to send us notes to call board members to call me to call teachers to call principals. Um, and we certainly internally, I've heard uh, this spring a number of discussions at, at frankly all the buildings and this in one way or the other. Um, the dilemma, of course, is how, how do you hold high expectations and uh, really push youngsters without putting that bar six feet over his head? So, you know, the idea of stretching somebody to jump, you know, six inches or six feet, um, and I think that's a matter of um, just plain ongoing discussion. But it would be really healthy for us to hear from the community as to their perceptions, what they would like. I would encourage people to do well, that. Well, when I you know, commented on the need for preparation, I think that uh, if we could start off with what is mandated, what we're required to do, what we're now doing, uh, what we've tried in the past, what the pros and cons of different programs are. I think that's the area where there's a lot of disagreement and honest disagreement, you know, in serious uh, uh, educational philosophy. Uh, and if somebody could cover those points, and not taking two hours to do it, but, but less, really succinctly, uh, and maybe in advance of the workshop, you know, circulate a, some sort of paper uh, not too many pages, you know, really try to boil it down. Then we could go into, and that would be the agenda. Now who's, who would volunteer to work on that, Jan, with uh, Connie? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I guess I'm down here at the end. Um, <laughs> the I will, stops I will. Is that what you're saying? That, I mean, that's just a suggestion. I mean, no, I would a, love to. I'm very interested in this. <laughs> It's a, that's really Why a... Why I moved tonight? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's a, everything goes downhill here. <laughs> Charlie moves for all the right reasons. Okay. Yeah, I've been looking this way a lot. <laughs> Charlie, you, know, you moved. <laughs> okay, so will you two uh, lead the charge on that? Uh, Surely. Uh, great. And find a, a date, make a schedule for one or more sessions on that. Well, we didn't make it under two hours tonight, but we tried. The final item, I think we're going to scratch, aren't we? Uh, yes, we agreed that there is no need. In, unless, I might say, uh, on the other hand, that uh, thinking out loud here, if uh, any of you, you know, who have not been participating, uh, would like to discuss the negotiations, we could go upstairs for a few minutes and discuss it. Um, I would like to. I would like to. I, there's a point that came up that I would like to. Okay. Discuss. Okay. Well, but before that, I'd like to just remind everybody because we won't be together again on television that uh, Tuesday, May seventh, is election day, and uh, just make sure that uh, you pay attention to what's going on out there and who's running, and uh, make sure everybody votes because it's going to be very important in the next uh, several years as the town faces uh, budget crisis and shortfalls of money, and. Uh, I urge all of you to pay attention as things happen in the next four to five weeks. That was all. Thank you, John. And I'm not that, there. So. I would entertain a, um, a motion that uh, we enter into executive session for the purposes of discussing uh, negotiations. 
So moved. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? 